Um, real quick, just wanted to uh, tell you a little bit about myself, tell you a little bit about Code Academy, and uh, then we can dive into the talk. My name is Ryan, uh, one of the two co-founders of Code Academy. Uh, we started about four years ago. This is back and myself, very, very early on in the company's history, and now we're 20 strong here in New York, uh, right at the street, 26th and 6th Avenue. And uh, Code Academy, as Wow, this is not following what I expected. Code Academy, as uh, was presented earlier, is an online learning platform for learning how to code. If you're an absolute beginner, uh, perhaps some of you started there. And if you're more experienced, we're constantly adding new content at more experienced levels all the time. So um, today, I wanted to start with a question that if you start a company called Code Academy, you get asked all the time, which is, what is code? And uh, it's one that I think everyone in this room here is probably very familiar with. And maybe uh, I hope you think uh, deceptively so. So I first want to cover why should we even ask the question? If it's so straightforward, what's the value in it? Uh, what happens when you try to answer this question? Things get a little bit crazy. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what I mean by that. And uh, at the end of the talk, this perfectly parlays off what we just covered. Uh, what can we all do to help distribute the power of code? And I'll tell you what I mean by that. So um, why ask, what is code? Well, I guess it's not the thing that makes my presenter work. <laughs> all right, so first off, it's what we do all day. Um, we sit in front of these desks, whichever one most look like yours. And we type and we produce code, we ship it, we deliver it, maybe we miss deadlines, maybe we fix bugs in it, but we live, eat, and breathe code as software developers. And a lot of people are studying it, more and more people every day, all over the world. It's, uh, as I'm sure you're familiar, it's incredibly popular, but not only is it a trend, it's getting integrated into curriculums all over the world. People are learning it at an early and earlier age it is becoming a fundamental topic of education. So we really should know what it is if everyone is trying to learn it. And if you code, I'm sure you'll be asked by someone, or you've already been asked, what is it? And you probably came up with some answer on the spot and said, uh, well, I, I guess it's how I do X or Y. Uh, but as practitioners of the craft, it's really important, I believe, for us to ask ourselves this question because we're reflecting on our craft, and it's important to reflect on our craft and understand what we're trying to do day to day. So what is code? And I'm sure some of you have read this piece, but in June of 2015, Paul Ford took an entire, not just an article, he took an entire issue of Bloomberg Business Week to answer this question. It was 38,000 words. And, and it's a wonderful piece. It's an incredibly hard question. And he explores the many, many facets of what code is as a craft. And he's really getting into, as a craft of code, what's involved, what are our lives, and what does it mean to someone who lives within that world but may not be a software developer themselves. And uh, I highly recommend you, you read this piece. I'm not going to go into code as a craft. I'm going to try to push beyond that, because I have neither the time nor the skill in this presentation to, to cover that. So I wanted to instead see what happened when uh, I poll the audience and people tell me what they think code is. In not 38,000 words, but in two sentences. And I got some really interesting results. Uh, at first, there were the answers that you would expect. These are the ones that we all give each other, right? Code is how we speak with computers. It's the language that we use to tell the computer what we want it to do. It's the things that uh, I think 99% of us in this room would all expect us to answer when we ask this question, right? So these are the, these are the obvious questions. It's the ones I use uh, to answer the question most of the time. But I think we all feel like this from time to time. Uh, the first one, I'll just start with code is a set of instructions software developers slave away at producing in order to build our new computer overlords. Uh, we have this complicated relationship with code. That's my point of these uh, quotes, is that as developers, sometimes we love it, sometimes we hate it, sometimes we don't really know what we're doing with it. We struggle with it, right? And so sometimes I feel like this. But the vast majority of people in the world don't even get to that point. To them, I mean, one of my friends sent me this, code is code for you've already lost me. As soon as you mention the word code, I'm going to give up. 
And that's just one of the biases that people bring to, to coding as a word. It's incredibly loaded, right? Um, the last one, though, is, is what I hear the most often from people who are not software developers or, or who are not sitting here in this room, which is, code is magic. And it's like, sure, you know, maybe we feel like code's magic when we write our program and it runs the first time. Uh, on a good day, we feel like it's magic. But I think this is an incredibly powerful idea, so I want to dive into this idea that code is magic. And code is magic as many forms. I think it's always helpful when you start um, a question, like what is something? It's good to study its past. And it's good to understand how has code evolved as a form over the years. And some of you may be very familiar with this. Some of you maybe never really even asked the question. But um, just a real quick tour of form and function. Code has existed in physical form as punch cards. It's existed as a metaphor. Uh, it was hypercard in the 80s, and that uh, metaphor was taken to a whole other level with mind storms, trying to find this visual representation of logic and deplete, completely move beyond pure uh, written statements and try to go into a structural statement of logic. And of course, you know, we have every script kitty's favorite uh, port scanner in the bottom right hand corner. So code has many forms, and all of these forms, in one way or another, produce code. Uh, as a tool, it's a specific tool. I like to say it's a lever. And what I mean by a lever is uh, whatever you put into it, you're going to get out multiplied. Right? That, that second quote about tequila and handguns kind of suggests this. Uh, code can let you do things that you'd never be able to do by yourself. Right? We know that and we think that's power. But not only is it a lever, it's a lever with power that's accelerating. So the power of code that we each have and that we wield is getting faster. At a faster and faster clip, it's getting more and more powerful. So. Uh, to dive into what I mean by code is a lever that's accelerating, there's just three macro trends. You can probably think of many more, but these are the three that I really like to grab onto, that the power that we all have in this room, it's getting more and more powerful as these things get more powerful. And I think that's a very interesting concept. Every day, and this exactly goes to Rob's talk, there are new ways to extract value from data, better algorithms that get more and more accurate, and those algorithms are made available to the world. Perhaps some of them are classified or not available because they're too powerful, by, deemed by the powers that be. But every day, there's new ways to extract that value. There's also services at every layer of the stack that will do things for us. And those services get more and more mature. And you know, the, the supply chain of pickaxes for the gold rush gets more and more robust. And you can use that. We were asking about Twilio. Does Twilio have a free developer plan? And that's just one part of this incredible supply chain that we all have access to at free tiers and at paid tiers. And the underlying part of all of this is cheaper costs. And uh, you know, this is just a graph right here of Amazon EC2 uh, price cuts. You know, from 2009 to 2014, it's halving almost every year. And that's very, very real value for whatever it is that you're trying to do. It's getting cheaper and cheaper for any one individual to buy computing power at a faster and faster rate. So this is what I mean by code is a lever and its power is accelerating. Excuse me? You don't have to buy it, you go to the cloud. Yeah, at whatever tier you want. So just to put all of these pieces together, let's just say any one of us in this room wanted to write a program and we say, computer, sift through, this stream of images, wherever you're getting it from, maybe you're getting it from the Twitter firehose, maybe you're getting it from some other data source, you say, I want to find all, all the images that are of Ryan's face. You can do that now. If you have enough images of my face, which you could probably get, you can probably get enough images of any one person's face to train a model, you can use a combination of the library I'm mentioning here is called OpenFace. This is an open source implementation of a uh, deep neural net implementation of facial recognition algorithm was uh, first published by Google at the beginning of this year. Software exists. It's benchmarked. Uh, I don't know if it's been in production yet, but someone has made it available to all of us. And not only is it published, it's relatively easy to use as far as you know, like advanced AI algorithms go. You download the package. You spend 30 minutes setting it together. You run a few code examples. And then you are up and running. It's incredible. And so you know, the very first thing you see on their website is a disclaimer about the power of this, this project. Please use it for good, not evil. And uh, you know, to me, this is, this is just one example of incredible power. And that power is getting uh, greater and greater. So uh, 
I think this, this begs us to just pause for a moment and say, uh, well, what do we each as individuals think? Should that power be centralized or distributed? And you know, this is a, this is a very common argument for power, right? And I'm not going to get into the details, and, and this is a separate talk, but I, I personally believe that the power of code should be distributed. It, it is something I've, I've dedicated you know, a good portion of my life to, and I believe that ultimately we are better off with the power of code being distributed. So if you believe that, um, how can we all help this? Like, you know, we're all, we're all, we write code every day. For anyone who writes code, how can we help distribute that power of code and help other people? So uh, I want to take a moment to talk a little bit about how I like to think of the, the world of, of efforts to do this. Uh, this, is, this is a dichotomy, but it's one that I find helpful. Uh, you can make the tool easier to, to, uh, to learn. And you can make it easier to learn the tool. They're different things. When I say you can make the tool easier to learn, you're not necessarily simplifying it. You, you might be making it more intuitive. You might be better aligning it with its purpose. And so I'm using a few examples here of where, you know, something that at least they put a handle on it. But like, God help me if I had to, to figure that out. Small talk, I see as an example of this, all the way to Scratch and visual programming languages. And then you can make it easier to learn the tool, right? Before Fortran, you know, when they were putting together the, the IBM 704, I, I, I don't even know if it was maybe an afterthought to say, oh yeah, maybe we should write a manual for how to program this thing. And that was the very first like, programming manual. And programming languages have been around, you know, as, as both written and in, in physical form like that, have been around for at least 10 years. So that was the very first the Fortran manual that I could find. There might be an earlier one, but that was the first kind of major moment where someone sat back and said, okay, we should, we should actually like, write down how to use this thing. And then all the way to you know, what we're trying to do with Codecademy. And there's, there's many more examples right on the cutting edge of uh, both with uh, Brett Vector is one example and Chris Granger, if you're familiar with their work, they do a lot of thought experiments on how to merge these two, I think, in a very interesting way. But uh, you know, when we think ourselves, like, okay, we all use code every day. What, what code do we enjoy using most? Right? And I find for me it's, it's the code that meets these two criteria. Code that are, that are easy for me to learn how to use and that are easy for me to use itself. That's the code I enjoy working with the most. I don't find myself cursing you know, whoever's name was last on the readme or you know, finding myself in a rabbit hole. It's an enjoyable experience. Right? And just to kind of highlight what I mean by the difference between these two, uh, I don't, we don't need to belabor this, but they're, they're different things in the sense of a browser is, uh, it's both intuitive and it's easy to use once you've learned how to use it. I'm saying it's easy to use because there's only so many things you can do. But then once you do learn how to use it, you're just clicking. Versus something like a 3D file navigator, like we stopped using those in the 90s because it was a bad idea. Not only was it hard to learn, but it was hard to use once you learned how to use it. So not all tools are equal in that sense. And so, I want to connect that to what we do every day as software developers. We are building tools for each other, we're building tools for ourselves, we know that, but why should we try to make all the tools that we build easy to learn and easy to use? Ultimately, it's because by doing that, we are sharing that power with other people. If you don't make the tools that you create easy to use and easy to learn, you're not letting other people use that power. You're consolidating it. A great example is the library, Rob, that you were talking about. If that library was hard to set up and hard to learn and hard to use, we wouldn't have just had that demo, right? Um, and so I think these are really, really important concepts. And so to just kind of tie this back all the way around, if you believe that, that code is power, that power is growing faster, and that uh, that power should be distributed, then I recommend that you make your code as easy to learn and as easy to use as possible. And it's when you achieve that that your code becomes magical. But magical in a very like, good sense, not in magical in a black box sense. I don't know, have any idea how this works. I hit a button, uh, cross my fingers, and on a Tuesday it works. But magical in the sense that it's really fun. And you can share it with people and that's great. So, um, you know, this this kind of does wrap around to a lot of the shoulds that we've all heard. As engineers, you should do a lot of things, right? You should write a great readme. You should provide a library of examples. 
you should use good code structure and make sure that uh, the code that you're writing is accessible and people can dive into it. I wanted to argue from another perspective why those shoulds exist. They don't exist just because someone told you to. They exist because ultimately the t you're allowing the tools that you're creating to be shared with other people. And I think that's a far more powerful perspective than just someone told you you should do something. We could also get into, OK, well, just how do you make something easy to learn? Also, just how do you make it easy to use? But it's the exact same design questions, I think, that you're ultimately faced with, right? Uh, I always think it's a question of how much thought have you put into your program? But to be a little bit more specific, what I mean about how much thought you put in your program, uh, I really believe in the Unix philosophy of single purpose. Um, once you've defined that single purpose, make sure that the interface that you're writing matches that single purpose, which is to say, don't give in to feature bloat. Don't be lazy with your entry points of your program. Be very conscious and deliberate with that interface. Um, but all this takes years and years of work. I think why Unix tools are so great is because they've been refined over so many years. And that is a reflection of exactly that kind of thought uh, that's gone into those. So um, in conclusion, I hope uh, I've convinced you that the shoulds that you've all read and that you're all aware of have a deeper fundamental purpose. And that deeper fundamental purpose is uh, to share the power of the tools that you're building. All right, thank you. So we track, look, if you want to distribute the power of code, it's important to make sure that that distribution is even or perhaps even greater in underrepresented demographics, both regionally, by all definitions. Is that, is that a fair encapsulation? So for the site, just like any consumer product, we look at our usage. And for Codecademy, it's public that over half of our active users are actually outside of the US. And we've continued to translate the product into at this point, we're in four uh, spoken languages, and we're working on adding two more at the moment. Uh, with respect to communities, with respect to integration of coding into a curriculum, we worked with a variety of governments across the world to do just that. Uh, we don't ask for specific demographic information on the site, um, but if you were to correlate it, you know, I, over half of our user base is, is outside of the US. Um, and there's, I mean, as I'm sure you're aware, if this is something that you follow, there's an incredible number of a diversity of programs to target individual demographics to cross that gap. What is the basis model? Like it's free so we started as a platform to bring free coding education to as many people as possible. And over the years, we've continued to develop both uh, better content and to add additional support on top of that which we are not publicly talking about yet, but is available on the site. And that's a premium service on top of the free service. Where do you see programming fluency as, as far as general population and then for like the future? Uh, well, it's, it's already in a lot of uh, K through 12 curricula across countries. And if it's not already part of the standards, uh, Many, many individuals are seeking out on their own, or parents are, are introducing their kids to it. So there's going to be much wider exposure than, than uh, there has been for, for my generation and, and older. Um, and I don't know what that's going to do. I think it's ultimately a good thing. I think it's a fantastic thing. I would have a very hard time predicting the impact of that. Um, but I think it will ultimately be. I think it will lift the perception of code. And there will always be the craft of code, which will be separate from literacy, if you will. Just like, just like writing, just like any other craft. So is it like IDE? I couldn't understand what the product actually does. Is it like Visual Studio? Uh, so the question was, uh, how does the Code Academy product provide a learning experience for, for coding? IDE. So it's an interactive IDE where we'll break up exercises that have you write code, and then we'll give you a response to 
whatever code you write in that moment. So last, uh, last question. Okay, great. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Well, it's all very nice and good that uh, uh, you had kids in elementary school that were learning how to code. But how do you keep people to code? coding? It's sort of, sort of like me learning German and not speaking for 20 years. Yep. Forget it. So uh, what's, what's the motivation for, for people to continue to code? And isn't there a danger that you're going to end up with a group that learns how to code and continues to code and, and a group that learns how to code and then never uses it? Well, I'll, I'll separate the questions. One is, um, how do you keep people committed and engaged to a lifelong learning endeavor, like coding or any other skill? And the second one is, is it dangerous to expose a large population to a skill where it's possible that a group will not stay committed to learning the skill for the rest of their life? Um, to the second question, I personally don't believe it's dangerous. I believe that familiarity and exposure is always better than lack of either. To the first question, it's clearly a question of what's your first experience, what's the quality of your experience, and what kind of support structure, and just how much will do you have to finish something, and what kind of community are you in to support you and make it normal or expected or safe or just even conceivable to dedicate yourself to coding as a craft. I, you know, perhaps most of us in this room were very fortunate to exist in such a community. I know I was, and many people aren't. So I hope through exposure and familiarity, uh, more people will have access to those kinds of communities. Um, so, I, I don't know, yes, just, just an opinion. I mean, I'm not sure exactly. I used Code Academy a while back, so I don't remember exactly how it works. But uh, to keep them, um, you know, coding and motivated. You need to give them a sort of purpose. Why am I coding? You know, when when uh, we did cosine and sine back in in, in school, uh, the first question is like, why the hell are we doing it? Man? Like, what, what am I going to use it for? But when you show them how, what are you going to maybe build something? Maybe on your website. I don't know if, if you do it. You build an app and you can maybe export it. You know, and you can have it on your computer. Uh, yep. Uh, so. Some people, when they learn a skill, they want, the, they want a tangible outcome or a real world example for why they're learning what they're learning. And uh, everyone brings different motivations to learning a skill. Some people are very motivated by outcome. And for those who are motivated by outcome, we try to provide that outcome, be it a project, um, be it a resume line item, or uh, some kind of certification that they've completed the skill. So it, it's different for everyone. And on Code Academy, we provide projects but we don't provide perhaps all of those motivations. Yeah, I'm not talking about yeah. certification or anything. I'm talking about, you know, like you said, building something. When you build yep. something, then you feel like you've done something, not just... And we, we provide that project context for almost all of our lessons and the languages that we teach to give you that context. Yeah, we got to go, though. Closing question. Sure. Uh, so you're a technical founder of a very successful company. Um, what advice would you give to aspiring technical uh, Well, thank you. Uh, I, I had a lot of fortune, so there's, there's always fortune involved. Um, I don't have a single piece of advice. If anyone is an aspiring technical founder, I'd be happy to talk to you in detail. Um, but, you know, everyone wants an answer to their question, and, and I'd say... Um, I never stopped building. That doesn't mean don't stop to pause and think about what you're doing, but you have to always keep building. If you pause too long and stop building, you're generally never going to get there. Uh, that's not sufficient, but it's at least one of the pieces. So thank you. Yeah, thank you.